Hello, listeners, and welcome to the Health Nexus podcast, powered by Jefferson Health. I'm Jessica Lopez. And I'm Carly Williams. We're bringing you our final episode of 2022, as well as a podcast announcement. Next year, the Health Nexus podcast will be the Living Well podcast. New year, new name, but don't worry, same content. We'll still be connecting with Jefferson Health experts on topics to help support your physical and mental well-being, like we have in today's episode. We sat down with pulmonologist Dr. Jessica Mose to figure out why the cold air can trigger respiratory symptoms for some people, like coughing and wheezing, and how we can better protect our lungs during winter months. She also gives us her take on the mouth taping trend and why mouth breathing is so detrimental to our health. So let's get into it. Here's our interview with Dr. Most. Hi, I'm Jessica Most. I am the director of the Severe Asthma Center at the Jane and Leonard Corman Respiratory Institute here at Jefferson Health. Dr. Most, can you tell us what it is about cold air that some people find that breathing it hurts their lungs or causes asthmatic symptoms? That's a great question. So the cold air actually hurts the lungs mainly because cold air is also dry air. And when we breathe that cold air in, it's actually drying out our airways and that feeling can feel like a burning feeling. And this is more common the colder it gets because as it gets colder, the humidity drops lower. So when you breathe that cold air in, it can dry out your airways. And for some people, that also causes a condition known as bronchospasm, where the airways will narrow. And this is more common in patients who have underlying lung conditions, such as asthma or COPD. And so what are some of the ways that we can better protect our lungs in the winter? So we can protect our lungs in the winter through a variety of different tricks. So the first one is to breathe through your nose when you're outside and your nose really helps to warm the air so that by the time it gets to the lungs, it's warmer. Our nose has a good filtration system in it. So it also helps to get rid of some of the particles that might irritate your lungs. The second thing that you could do is you could wrap a scarf or a gaiter around your face. This has actually been great in the times of COVID with us wearing masks because it helps to keep the air warm. So that can really be helpful too. The other thing is if you're going to be exercising outside is you'd want to do a slower warm up period so that you're nice and warm before you start really exercising vigorously. Breathing through your nose seems to be having its moment. Mouth taping has been all over my TikTok lately. Yes. So it's actually pretty amazing that breathing through our nose is such an important thing. Only about half of people tend to breathe through their nose and the other half of people tend to be mouth breathers. But there's a lot of health benefits to breathing through our nose. The breathing through the nose actually activates different parts of your nervous system. So it can be helpful for relaxation. And there was an excellent author who wrote a book called Breath. He did an experiment where he had his nose plugged up for a month and trended his health. And over the course of the month, his sleep declined, his blood pressure went up, and he felt really terrible. And so I think he was one of the ones who got a lot of people interested in this mouth taping, because you can train yourself to breathe in through your nose if you sort of focus on doing that whenever you're thinking about breathing. I know mouth breathing also isn't great for your dental health. My dentist reminds me every visit. I am a self-proclaimed mouth breather, so maybe I need to try taping. Yeah, so they have a mouth tape that you can get to wear at night because I, too, am a mouth breather at night. And so I started using this tape to try to focus on breathing more through my nose. So, yeah, it will dry out your mouth and you're more likely to get cavities if you're a mouth breather. Fun fact, my husband has been experimenting with mouth taping, actually. But going back to when you're walking or running outside, is there a difference between coughing or wheezing when you're doing an activity? If you have an underlying lung condition such as asthma, one of the things that can be helpful is using your rescue inhaler prior to going to exercise outside. And I would recommend about 15 to 20 minutes prior to exercise. The other thing is that if you're going to start all of your exercising outside, I would start with a walk, really kind of get the muscles warm. 
it's easier to focus on breathing through your nose when you're breathing at a slower rate. And I would be focusing on breathing through your nose and maybe wearing a mask or a scarf over your face. Then once you feel sort of suitably warm, the blood is flowing, you can kind of pick up your pace. And I always think it's really helpful though, to listen to your body. If you're feeling like the lungs are constricted or you start coughing or wheezing, that would be a good time to sort of stop, slow your pace down, take some deep breaths, maybe use your rescue inhaler again before you continue. You could also consider trying to do a little bit of warming up before you leave your house and then go outside because usually once you've started exercising for about 10 to 15 minutes, the lungs will start to relax. The blood flow in the lungs is better. The airways will start to dilate and you'll be able to exercise more easily. Is there a difference between like coughing during your exercise or you run or walk and you get home and you walk in the door and you take off your layers and then you start coughing or wheezing? Yeah, I think everybody's a little bit different. And I would say that it's probably a similar mechanism. It's just that some people tend to have it more kind of afterwards when they stop where their lungs start to narrow a little bit more as those exercise effects wane. Uh, But that would be a perfect opportunity to use your rescue inhaler. That's also your lungs telling you maybe you need some better hydration. So if you stay more hydrated, that's going to help have your lungs get less dried out when you're exercising. And so maybe also prioritize some water before you start your exercise. That's a great tip. I would have never thought your lungs could get dehydrated. This is a problem for a lot of our lung patients is that they tend to make mucus and then the mucus can get really thick, which is more of a problem in the winter. So one of the first tips we always give patients is make sure you're staying well hydrated because even if you use some over-the-counter medications, a lot of people like to use mucinex or guafenicin, it's not going to work well if you're not well hydrated. The water needs to come from somewhere. And another tip in that regard is using a humidifier in your home it can really at least help keep your indoor air a little moister. And that will, again, have your lungs be a little less dry overall. The like humidifiers got a bad rap because they're like, if you don't keep up with cleaning them, then it's just you're breathing in mold. They did. And in fact, pulmonologists have a really sort of mixed feelings about humidifiers because it can be a source of getting mold in your lungs and and that can cause a bad reaction. But they can really be helpful if used correctly. The other problem is hot humidifiers were sort of a danger to children, but now everything is mostly cold steam. So as long as you're keeping up with your cleaning, you should be fine. And I highly recommend uh, a humidifier in your bedroom in the cold winter months. That kind of leads us to our next question about like turning up the thermostat too high when it's really cold outside. Like fact or fiction, does that drastic change in temperature, can that deplete the body's moisture and like your lungs and make you work harder to adjust to the temperatures? This is a tough question, but some of it depends on what kind of heating you have. So, you know, radiator heat is a little moister than forced air heat. So that's a concern. Certainly, if you're cranking the heat way up, it can certainly lead to more dry temperatures. The other thing that happens when the humidity is low inside is that there's more dust in the air. And so if you happen to be somebody who has a dust allergy, that may be impacting you more, which is another group of patients that I tend to recommend humidifiers if they have a lot of sensitivity to dust. It's also a good reason to stay on top of your dusting in your home and to make sure you're regularly cleaning your bedding. Is having the heat up in your home going to make you feel colder when you're outside? That's a tough question. My Californian sister thinks that anything below like 60 degrees is freezing because she's not used to the colder temperatures. But I think most of us people here in the Northeast get pretty used to the cold air. I don't know. I'm from Michigan. I'm still always cold. (laughs) I have a a follow-up question with the rescue inhalers. If you're coming back from running and you haven't been diagnosed with asthma, are rescue inhalers only for asthmatics? 
So usually a rescue inhaler is used for somebody with asthma, but there are a group of patients who get bronchospasm and may not necessarily have a diagnosis of asthma. For one example, a lot of people post viral infection, and unfortunately winter is a time for a lot of viral infections, will have really sensitive airways. And so they'll almost act a lot like an asthmatic sort of post-viral infection. A lot of those patients end up getting a rescue inhaler as well to use. So essentially, no one should feel like they are just doomed to not breathe well in the winter months. I think that's a really good thing to bring to your provider because a lot of times when patients come, they may not, maybe I saw them in the spring or summer when it was warm. And so I don't know that they're having a hard time in the winter. So I think what Um, It's really helpful to bring these things and say, hey, you know, this is what I want to be able to do. I'm not able to do that. And then that gives me the information that I need to understand that we need to adjust your asthma therapy. And what's hard about asthma is the fact that it can very much be seasonal. And so sometimes we do need to have a plan for certain times of the year that's different than other times of the year. So this is like an opportunity that I would love to have for any of my patients to, you know, give me a call and and let me know that they're having a harder time. And can you talk a little bit about what is good asthma control and how do you work with patients to make sure they're breathing easier year round? So I consider good asthma control is that you should be able to do all of your activities that you want to do. Okay. So if that means that you want to join me on my Peloton or you want to take a jog outside or you just want to be able to keep up with your kids around the house, your asthma should not be preventing you from doing that. The second thing is that you're not having symptoms at night. So nighttime symptoms usually mean that asthma is acting up. And so we like patients to have no nighttime symptoms. And in general, we want people to feel like they're not needing a rescue medication more than twice a week. So that's good asthma control. Some people can get good asthma control with just using an as-needed inhaled steroid plus an airway opener. Some people really benefit from having a daily inhaler. So that's really a conversation to be having with your provider once you know where you want to go with your asthma control. And then sometimes it requires a couple trial and error. We try one approach and maybe that doesn't work and we find that using a daily inhaler is better. The other thing is that if people tend to be fine, but then when they get bad, they really flare. Those patients, I sort of err on having a little bit more background medication because I want patients to be able to get through a viral infection or a bad allergy time of year without having a flare. And we can do that with the right medication. Air purifiers are a hot topic these days. We were wondering if you had any tips or advice on air purifiers and like how they're helping alleviate allergies or asthma, and if you have any recommendations for purchasing them. Yeah, I love air purifiers. I have a couple in my house. They're really great for pet dander. So if you have a pet, especially a pet that you're allergic to, I think they're really helpful for that. Uh, They also do pull out some other pollutants from the air. So I think that that's really good. They range greatly in price. So I usually tell people, Find one that fits the size of your room. The, you know, the bigger ones are for bigger rooms are also more expensive. So I think the bedroom is an excellent place. That's where my cat and I like to sleep. So I have one in my bedroom and are not as great for dust. So that's one of the things to know about them. I think the humidifier is better for lowering the dust and making sure you're washing things thoroughly. And then the other thing that I think about when I'm purchasing them is the cost of the filters. So sometimes the air purifier will not be that expensive, but the filters need to be replaced very frequently and are expensive. Whereas other ones that might have a little bit more of an expensive upfront cost, they either have washable filters or you don't have to replace the filters as often. So you really have to shop around a little bit for the air purifiers, but there was a really interesting study that was done in COPD patients. And we don't really think about COPD patients um, as much when we think about allergies. And they actually found that having an air purifier in their home reduced those patients' risk of exacerbations. And 
I'm wondering if some of it is related to removing allergens. Others, there were still a fair amount of patients who were living in a home where people smoked. And I think it was also helpful there too. So I really think anyone with a lung condition could probably benefit from having an air purifier. Adding it to our holiday wish list. And I kept a little tally of the things we've talked about that I think anybody with lungs could benefit from having in their home, including the mouth tape, humidifier, purifier, and staying hydrated. Is there anything else that we could add to that list? So we can't add this to our wish list, but I would really like it if we could add air quality to our wish list because we are really recognizing how much that's impacting people's lung health. This has been an issue all over the world. There are some areas in the world where you cannot actually go outside. The air quality is so bad for anybody with lungs, not we're not even talking about people who have issues with their lungs. And this is a problem with Philadelphia. There's a big movement to cleaning up the air in Philadelphia. And I think that this is something that everyone should really be paying attention to. And we really should all be advocating for good air quality. This is an area where there's a lot of health disparities in relationship to lung disease. So my group did a study several years back And we found that if levels of particulate matter were high in a patient's geographic area, that they were more likely to have poor asthma control. And this has been shown by several other groups as well. Final question, Dr. Most. If you're experiencing asthmatic symptoms, at what point should you see a pulmonologist versus your primary care doctor? So if you already have a pulmonologist, I would say that anything lung related, you should just go right to your pulmonologist. That's what we're here for is to take good care of your lungs. And usually your primary care doctor is probably taking care of several other things too. So we're happy to focus on the lungs. If you've never seen a lung doctor, when should you see a lung doctor? I would say that you should see a lung doctor If you've seen your primary care provider and you have tried a couple different interventions without success, I would also say if you've ever been hospitalized for a lung condition, it is beneficial to see a lung doctor at least once. Sometimes patients just need tweaking of their therapy and then can follow along with their primary care doctor. We really like to collaborate with other members of the team. I don't really want my patients to need to see 10 doctors every three months. And if you also are having difficulties with the medications that have been prescribed by your primary care doctor, I think that's another good time to see a specialist. There are a lot of nuances to the various inhaled therapies, and we're pretty good at troubleshooting, you know, what one might work better for which person. So if it hasn't been an easy fix, I think that's a great time to see a specialist. I mean, I know how important it is to be hydrated, but I'm still not over the fact that your lungs can be dehydrated. Oh my gosh, yeah, or how bad mouth breathing can be. A reminder, we publish full episode transcripts on thehealthnexus.org. We'll link that page in the show notes along with links to the book Dr. Most recommended and more. If you enjoy our podcast, we truly appreciate a rating on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if there are topics you'd love to hear more about, please email us at healthnexus at jefferson.edu. Production support for today's episode provided by Brittany Raffalak and Barbara Henderson. We're your hosts, Jessica Lopez and Carly Williams. Thank you for listening. We'll be back in 2023. Be well.